if you care about the climate, you stop eating beef. For sure, you've seen this kind of headlines. And as a listener of this podcast, you know the reality is much more nuanced and way more complex. Today, we dive deep into the research side of regenerative agriculture. And I feel confident to say that most of the research, if not all, you've seen about the climate impact of agriculture is completely wrong. For instance, did you know that most life cycle assessments or LCAs, that's our current standard to compare the environmental impact of products to each other, never took into consideration the soil carbon sequestration potential of agriculture. So it only looked at the emission side of things. And as we'll discover today, that is extremely, extremely simplified. Or the amazing topic of CO2 equivalent, which tries to boil everything down to one number and doesn't look at the differences between methane, CO2, fossil carbon, etc. And you might have seen these titles of a few articles a few years ago about claiming that beef and other animal protein can be farmed carbon positively or negatively, depending on your point of view. Where did this research come from and how was it done? And most importantly, what are the challenges? What are the pieces still missing in this life cycle assessment world? And how can we make this type of research more robust? Enjoy. This is the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, where we talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities, and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why my focus on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land and our sea, grow our food, what we eat, wear and consume. And it's time that we as investors, big and small, and consumers start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. To make it easy for fans to support our work, we launched our membership community. And so many of you have joined us as a member. Thank you. If our work created value for you, and if you have the means, and only if you have the means, consider joining us. Find out more on gumroad.com slash investing in Regen Ag. That is gumroad.com slash investing in Regen Ag. Or find the link below. Welcome to another interview today with Mariko Torbeck, independent consultant bridging between corporate climate and net zero commitments and regenerative agriculture. Welcome, Mariko. Thanks, Cohen. Thanks for having me. And maybe some people won't recognize your name, but have definitely seen your work on the life cycle assessment pieces and especially looking for the first time in many cases into soil carbon, into multi-stack species operation, et cetera, operations, et cetera, et cetera. But to start with a personal question, um, when did your fascination for soil or how did you roll into the, the life cycle assessment space uh, focused on regenerative agriculture? What was that? Do you remember how you got into this space? Because you can do life cycle assessments and this kind of research anywhere or in many, many other places. And ag is definitely not the first place people think about. And somehow you ended up um, working mostly on this. How, how did that happen? Yeah, I mean, for me personally, I would say it's, it's really been for the love of food. Um, my husband and I have a two acre micro farm um, where we have dairy goats and chickens and ducks and a, a really big garden. Um, I think at this point, many people know that food and health are intricately connected. Um, I think working in nature and with nature um, and mental health are intricately connected. And I think that a big part of what I enjoy is kind of bridging between the sort of small scale, having a little agricultural sandbox area um, in my own home and figuring out how does that then scale globally and um, within the context of what a lot of the global food and ag companies are looking at, which is typically using um, LCA or life cycle assessment as a tool to better understand where the impacts and opportunities lie um, within agriculture. And farming yourself as well, uh, on a small scale, but nonetheless farming, what, what's been the biggest surprise or the biggest lessons learned and um, doing this yourself and and not just I mean, quote unquote, obviously, uh, researching this from from a distance uh, on, on with your academic hat on. Yeah, I mean, it's maybe it's no surprise, but I think one thing we've definitely discovered um, in the last three years is that the best laid plans almost never, never come to fruition. Um, but there are always important um, lessons to be learned along the way. I mean, a few examples this year has been 
absolute insanity with the um, the highly pathogenic avian um, influenza that's been going around the U.S. Um, so I had my entire you know rotational um, grazing plan um, in place for the goats, the ducks, and the chickens. And then all of a sudden, we were basically told that we need to quarantine all of our birds <laughs> and keep them confined inside. Um, so that's an example of, of where things didn't go to plan. Um, but I think that, you know, soil health and really understanding the interactions between the livestock, the plants, the soil, and as well, just, you know, there's so many things to learn about even like parasite management and, and livestock management that we've, we've definitely learned a lot in the last three years, uh, made several mistakes, but every year we see, uh, some really good improvements to what we're doing. And just to look at that, I think many people in the space, um, saw some of your coming out and now I think two or three years ago. Um, on white oak pastures. And, and I think the first LCA is honestly looking at a, a larger regenerative system and, and got very excited when they saw the infographics, like you could store this amount of carbon. And uh, this is, it was um, done when you were working at Qantas and I think paid for by General Mills. Can you summarize, I mean, I will, I will link below obviously the papers, which I, I recommend everybody to read and go deeper into this just to understand the, the dynamics and limitations and the opportunities, et cetera. Um, but can you summarize it in a few sentences? What do you, what was the body of work? Why is it so unique? And then we'll go to the, the outcomes as well and, and what, what it tells us and what it doesn't tell us. Yeah, man, summarizing all of it in a few sentences might be a, a bit challenging. A few more, a few more is fine. No, we have, we have time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this, this work, the bulk of it was done back in 2018. Um, so that's, I guess, around four years ago now. Um, and basically at that point in time, most companies were leveraging um, life cycle assessment to better understand the sort of impacts and opportunities within agriculture. Um, however, one of the challenges with life cycle assessment at the time was that it was basically a tool that was um, quantifying or estimating emissions associated with agriculture and not looking at, you know, carbon's part of a cycle. So there's emissions of carbon, but then there's also carbon sequestration and carbon sinks, um, such as in soil and biomass. So basically, LCA was looking at one half of the equation. Um, which makes look agriculture things, really bad. <laughs> which makes <laughs> agriculture look insanely bad and wasn't looking at the sequestration potential. Now, anecdotally, at the time, there had been a lot of, um, you know, articles and sort of examples of farms that were using, you know, regenerative grazing practices, things like um, rotational rotational grazing, using multi-species, um, and anecdotally, we're seeing improvements to the health of their soil, to, you know, the increase in their topsoil um, and the health of the land. And what we wanted to do was to try and see, could we capture some of these benefits in an LCA? And how might that change the narrative around what, um, you know, agriculture could look like beyond just looking at how do we produce food in a way that's as carbon efficient as possible from an emission standpoint to looking at if we start to look at the sequestration, do some of these systems that a lot of people would consider to be inefficient, um, either inefficient uses of land or inefficient uses of carbon, would they actually um, fare better if we started to quantify the soil carbon sequestration? Um, so through um, this work was funded by General Mills. At the time, they had just acquired um, the Epic brand, which makes um, like uh, animal protein, like beef jerky um, type bars. And they had one farm in their supply chain in particular called White Oak Pastures, um, who had been basically practicing this regenerative grazing, um, holistic land management for, um, at the time, around 20 years. And so it kind of provided the perfect opportunity to combine, um, yeah, General Mills' desire to better understand regenerative agriculture, to better quantify 
um, their company and their subsidiaries um, carbon emissions in a more holistic way. Um, and yeah, that led to, uh, to this body of work. And what shocks me is that on the LCA side or in, on all of this research is that the, the potential or the drawdown potential is, wasn't really looked at until now, mostly the, uh, the pollution side of things or the emission equivalent, which is always a tricky one because we put everything under one, uh, one number at the end, but we'll, we'll talk about that as well. So this is, was, was and is revolutionary work. Have you seen since then, because you mentioned this is, um, work you did four years ago, or the research site was four years ago, then it, of course, been written, peer reviewed and published, uh, which means we're four years further uh, down the line. But have you seen others like taking that challenge of, of even, I mean, the first challenge of like trying to quantify the potential of drawdown in soil and biomass, or um, unfortunately, it has been a very, a very empty field until now? Yeah, no, I think um, at the time, if one was to do a literature review on soil carbon sequestration in LCA, there was almost nothing um, that was popping up. Now we know others were working on this, you know, simultaneously, but um, due to the nature of, you know, research and, and publishing, we didn't actually see those, um, those papers coming out until several years later. So I would say since then, um, a lot of kind of papers and articles have been focused on how do we start to quantify the drawdown, the soil carbon sequestration. And in particular, it's been um, a pretty hot topic amongst the kind of corporate um, climate commitment space. Um, the Science-Based Targets Initiative um, back in February just published their draft um, forest land and agriculture guidance for how companies can um, set targets related to um, land and, and agricultural based emissions. And it now looks like they're moving from um, a previous state, which was not allowing companies to account for soil carbon sequestration or for any sort of sequestration towards their targets to now allowing them to do so. Um, and that's really, I think, going to change the way that companies think about um, the potential setting, of, of agriculture yeah. exactly to meet their climate targets. And so that's on the, the carbon potential. And, and so just to, to what were some of the conclusions or what were some of the outcomes you saw um, out of that study and body of work? Because what you did, I think, is looked at, of course, the 20 year land, like the pieces of land and the, the fields that they've been working on for 20 years. And I uh, encourage anybody to go deeper into the work of wider pastures because it's very, very interesting to say the least. But you also looked at some newly acquired land, the graded land that they bought recently, I mean, now five years ago, probably, and, and what, how quickly that started to change. And, and what, what did you see there in, in quite an advanced and complex uh, regenerative uh, or farm using regenerative practices? How, how fast were, were changes that you saw and, and how instrumental was that compared to the total emissions of the farm? Because obviously that's what, Epic and General Mills wanted to know, like, does it stack up? Is it is it relevant in our in in what we emit uh, and and what is the potential of the the sequestration, basically? Yeah, no, that's a great question, and maybe that's um, a good time for me to just kind of explain how the soil sampling worked. Um, I'm not a soil scientist. We partnered with um, a soil scientist to handle all of the the sampling work. Um, so that was one thing that was unique about this study is other in other cases where people are trying to quantify the soil carbon, a lot of times they're relying on models um, where they're collecting data inputs, they're plugging those inputs into some sort of model um, that's then, you know, giving an estimate of what the soil carbon potential might be. Um, for this study, we really wanted to, the results to be as robust as possible. Um, so we did opt to take um, soil samples directly from the farm. Um, that comes with its own, you know, set of limitations and uncertainties that are different from modeling, um, but it does um, give us a little bit more confidence in the results that we were seeing. So there's two main approaches to um, kind of sampling soil carbon over time and understanding those changes. One is to basically take a sample in one year, wait a few years, take another sample, wait a few years, take another sample. Same spot, um, same depth, had, same, same time spot, of year, same day, same, yeah. 
Same everything. Exactly, exactly to the extent that that can be controlled. Um, if we had wanted to do that with white oak pastures, uh, we would have had to have started this work 20 years ago. Um, so that was not a good option for for this study. Which, it could be an option are there farms for that have done that? Studies. Like are there are there farms that have been do because there would be an amazing body of of data basically or or like has somebody done that like retrospectively just making sure we take as as we take a picture every year in some places just to follow or a shot actually for a video or documentary like. The biggest little farm, I think, did this for seven years in certain spots every year, the same shot at the same time, etc. Like, have we taken any of those for, for the soil carbon side or that's been wishful thinking? Or maybe 20 years ago, we weren't so much looking at that. You know, I'm, I'm pretty sure there are scientists who have looked at that. Um, but again, you know, soil is so specific to the region, to the thing that scientists are trying to study, whether it's an ecosystem, whether it's agriculture. Um, I don't know for sure, but I've definitely seen like soil health lectures with, where they'll show um, uh, Gabe Brown's soil carbon data. Um, so he's one of the kind of U.S. pioneers of, of Regen Ag. Um, but I've definitely seen graphs um, that actually, talk I about his soil carbon data all I the way back in to Rothamstead, actually, Yeah, I've seen that as well. And I think in Rothamsted in the U.K., because for sure we'll get emails now, um, they have the largest <laughs> soil sample library and history book, basically, where um, I've been in that library, actually, and it's absolutely stacked with soil samples going back I think 160 years or something on, on their farm, on their research farm. So there is something. And then, of course, you could you could now take some sampling and, and go and run it through the new sensors and labs we have. So there's for sure ways to do it. But I don't think on these active farms, yeah, most people didn't have the time nor the budgets and the research to to do that on every field or every piece. So, OK, so that's that's one uh, approach which you couldn't do obviously <laughs> because you couldn't travel back 20 years. So what's the other approach that you opted for? Yeah, so the other approach is called a chrono sequence approach. Um, and in essence, it's substituting space for time. Um, and so the reason that this site was so well suited to a chrono sequence approach was because it had sort of its, uh, when I when we were doing the study, the total farm acreage was, I believe, around 3,000 acres. Um, However, it had kind of started with a smaller amount of land and almost every year in the, in, in the last 20 years had acquired uh, new land. So basically what that meant is we had um, some portions of the farm that had been under that management practice for 20 years. And we had other portions of the farm that had been Just purchased, yeah. you know, just had just gotten started. And so basically, I don't remember the exact um, years, but we were able to identify um, using um, the kind of soil. Um, there was like a soil database because we wanted to make sure when we were sampling fields, we were sampling fields that had as similar soil profiles as possible. Um, and we were basically able to identify, I think there was a a year zero field that they had just purchased had not been under any sort of animal um, influence. Um, and then I think there was like a three, five, seven, and then like all the way up Almost to like cohorts, 20 yeah. year um, plots. Exactly. And so using we are, uh, the chrono sequence is basically saying, let's pretend like this year zero field is what the year, you know, 20 field started out as. And basically then um, you can see that the year 20 field uh, was storing a lot more carbon um, than the, the year zero field. And that sort of assumes, and I know that's not true, um, that the, the exact management practices stay the same. How do, you, how do you work with that as they learned, I think, a lot into that past 20 years and have been adjusting their approach? Um, how do you adjust in that for uh, in, in the research, basically, that it's not every field has had the same treatment for 20 years or 15 or five or 10? Yeah. And I mean, that's where our goal um, as kind of the LCA practitioners was to really understand directionally what is happening and get as close to a magnitude as possible. Um, but yeah, that's a, you know, if, if we had been doing this to advance soil science, 
we might have been a lot more careful to say, okay, what was the exact management practice on the 20 year field? How did that differ from the, you know, seven year field? What's different? Um, but overall, the things we were pretty confident in were that the original land use um, before being converted to perennial pasture uh, was pretty consistent. So in that region of, of Georgia, I think um, it was predominantly being um, the crop rotation was something like wheat, you know, peanut, corn, and soy um, that were basically being grown in, in very chemical intensive systems. Um, a lot of erosion had occurred. Um, so you had very, very degraded land that they were starting with. Um, and then, yeah, we didn't, we did see like there was quite a bit of variation um, in the soil carbon that was stored in each of the different fields. And that's probably reflective of the fact that the management wasn't identical over the last 20 years. Um, but what we did see was a very strong directional trend line um, of the carbon sequestration. And basically that trend line was around five to six times higher um, than what would be considered normal for grazing systems um, in that region of the US. Okay, so five to six times higher. Uh, wh wh what does that mean in, in terms of like in terms of potential of soil carbon sequestration in terms of what what is what's the five X or six X here? Yeah, so they were essentially drawing down carbon five to six times faster using their multi-species, you know, rotational... Compared to what um, we, we know grazing. now or compared to what, what is the standard of, of perennial grazing there and thus what we've been using in models as well. So there were... Does it suggest we're way off yeah, in terms of what we expect, what we calculated until now? No, so that was compared to what the literature said was likely the potential rate of sequestration of perennial pasture in yeah in that region of the US. Wow. Um that's was likely not integrating multi-species yeah. and not um doing the same adaptive multi-paddock yeah. um grazing. Exactly. That's a massive difference. Like five to six times. I mean it depends what, what the, the, the starting point is obviously. Um but that's a, a very big difference. And then how that did that lead into, because I, I saw the headlines and infographics of basically claiming carbon negative beef. Um, and of course they compared it to, to some plant-based or, or let's say non-beef uh, burger <laughs> once, which did it very well, did very well on the infographics. Um, but w what was the quote unquote conclusion? Because you can never conclude these things because then we're going to talk about the, the limitations and, and the, or let's say the possibilities of further research. And um, what, what did that lead to compared to the emission side? Because of course, that was what you mentioned. We want to bring in the potential of sequestration into the normal work of LCASs, which is looking at the emission side of things. How did those two uh, stack up basically? Yeah, so there were two parts um, to the study. One was that we did look at the entire farm um, when we were trying to capture the emissions. Um, and then because General Mills through Epic was sourcing beef from the farm, they wanted to understand specifically the footprint of that beef. Um, so we looked at the whole farm and then we looked at the beef footprint. Um, this is where some of the LCA jargon um, <laughs> comes into play. But essentially, um, the way that you understand the beef emissions in the context of an entire farm. Um, and I don't think I mentioned, but at the time, the farm had, um, they had beef, they had um, chicken for meat, they had egg layers, they had pork, uh, sheep, goat, um, duck, guinea fowl. So they, they had quite a few, um, quite a few species. So part of the challenge is untangling, um, you know, from a complex multi-species operation, um, how do we understand what the beef footprint is in the context of that? Um, and in some ways, that's a bit of an arbitrary, you know, exercise. We use the best practice in LCA, um, which is essentially economic allocation. And so all of the animals were contributing to the soil carbon sequestration that was occurring on the farm and to the... Um, but which one uh, did what is obviously tricky exactly which so one just did what the, yeah uh, is a tricky question um so essentially what we did was from the entire farm we were able to pretty cleanly separate the beef only emissions 
um, because in our models, we were looking at things like, um, yeah, how many head of cattle did they have? What were their age ranges? Um, what were, how much manure were they producing? And what did the models say the um, emissions from that were? You know, how much feed were they digesting? And what did the models say were the emissions from that? Um, these are the same models that looked, predicted yeah. the soil carbon potential where we're five to six times off. So how, how do we know, let's say, uh, do we need a lot more research also on that side of things? Because I think a lot of this data comes from and uh, not from these kind of systems. So how do we, let, let's unpack that later. So you, you were, you were uh, taking <laughs> this into account now, because I'm, I'm really wondering, and I've seen more and more, um, I wouldn't say suggestions, but a lot of this data on the methane side, on the emission side comes from a CAFO operation. So the factory farm side of things which is a very different kind of approach, let's say the least, if you have been in one compared to something like this. And so we might be off by a factor X uh, when we look at uh, emissions and emission equivalent, which probably makes all these infographics look really odd or weird if you had to um, go deeper into that. So that that's an, an, a side note. Um, but so you looked at all of that and then separate out the beef side because that went to Epic and that was of course what General Mills was interested in. And then what what was there basically the um, a bit tricky but still doable uh, um, conclusion coming out of that? Yep. So then for the sequestration, we basically had the total sequestration, um, well, the, the rate of sequest, the annual rate of sequestration for the farm, um, because an LCA typically looks at a single operating year. Um, we then looked at the total sequestration that occurred in that um, operating year that we were looking at. Um, and then through LCA best practice, um, we did economic allocation. So basically that set that looks at all of the revenue that's being generated on the farm. Um, and then basically, you know, if beef is say generating 50% of the revenue, it says 50% of the sequestration can be allocated to beef. Um, so this isn't a perfect, you know, scientific but it's workable. way yeah. of doing it, but it is the industry best practice for when, when allocation needs to happen. So basically the conclusion um, was that um, within our estimates, we do think that the net total emissions for beef is likely negative. Um, we'll probably touch on some of these uncertainties and error bars and, and things like that. Yeah, because that. I saw a huge um, bar on but, methane and, and a very conservative uh, number even on that. So, which is very interesting. But let's say uh, the, the, um, if you look at the beef alone within this system, it seems like a, a carbon negative, which is a positive thing. Let's just be very clear here. Uh, a carbon negative footprint. Um, and then looking at the farm as a whole, um, it was a different outcome. It was, it was significantly less carbon, but not a, a carbon negative conclusion, right? Yeah. So looking at the whole farm, and I had to pull up the PowerPoint to remember this number, um, it looked like the soil carbon sequestration in that operating year um, was offsetting around 85% of the total farm's um, emissions for that year. Which is massive, just even, even and now we go into the, the uncertainties there. So what, what would be, I think that's a massive conclusion, a, a massive potential. What, was that a surprise to you? Did you know some of these, like what was, like when you first saw these results or when um, you, you were making these PowerPoints to present this as well, what was, what was the biggest surprise you, you found in doing this research? Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't say the results were surprising. Um, but I think what was most exciting is um, I was on the farm when the soil samples were being taken. And so we're going field to field. We start with the kind of year zero, you know, the, the lower um, year fields. And basically the soil is it's bright red clay down there. And the year zero field had basically no dark topsoil on it. It was just basically an all red clay core. Um, and we did meter deep cores. So this was like a truck going down a whole meter. So you could see the, you know, the, the different horizons, which was very cool. Um, by the time we got to the, the fields that had been under management for several years, all of a sudden you could, you could visibly see the topsoil layer, the dark, um, rich, you know, organic, um, matter topsoil layer on top, um, visibly growing. And so, you know, by year 20, you had just a, a core with a significant, you, you could visibly 
tell with your eyes that the topsoil on this farm um, was increasing. And we had somebody, watching... we had Nicole Masters actually that said you could smell it as well. Like you can, even if we're not trained, like if you're not a farmer, et cetera, you can smell the difference if your eyes closed between healthy soil and non-healthy soil. But of course we can see it as well. And you saw it. I believe it. And that's the amazing thing about animals on pasture is you can go and enjoy the farm and not be overwhelmed by the aromas that <laughs> a lot of that's people also, I mean, that's, our nose is a very, very pleasant. Our nose is a very <laughs> strong sensor. Yeah. And, and good compost, good stuff doesn't smell. It smells exactly. earthy and very, exactly. there's some, something that's a whole different discussion, but there's something I think deep in there that suggests something that we, we generally like this earthy smell and don't like the smell smell, let's say. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, but yeah, so what was, there was kind of the waiting period between when we sent the samples off to the lab and we're kind of waiting to get the, you know, the quantification um, of carbon for each sample back. Um, so it was very, very exciting to see those soil cores and what you could visibly see as, um, you know, soil health improving throughout the, the 20 year chrono sequence um, to finally translate that into you know what we thought was the sequestration rate um, at the farm and then to to visibly see how that stacked up to um, what a typical lca would consider to be the the emissions side of the equation um, so that was that was very exciting i don't know that i was surprised um, by the result I, I guess i was you know i think in many of these cases you're sort of fearing the worst you're fearing that you're going to be working on a study um beef is already so controversial so you have all of these emissions and you're worried that the sequestration is going to be meaningless and if that's the case you know it's really becomes even more difficult to make the case for regenerative agriculture for livestock integration for kind of rebuilding our our ecosystems and reintegrating animals to the land um but when we see these results um it i think it is it does show some really good promise for what the the potential of using animals to restore degraded land could be from a carbon perspective and to unpack another piece of that puzzle before we go to what can be improved or how can we make these results much more robust, which it sounds like we need to revisit the models on the emission side as well. But there's in the, the paper, the final paper, there is this mention of it. Uh, it all sounds super amazing and very interesting, significantly lower uh, emissions or significantly um, lower uh, total emissions when you count the sequestration, but it does require twice and a half uh, times the land can we unpack that a bit like what uh, leads to that because it's such a low input way um it's intensive and extensive at the same time how can that lead to two and a half times more land and or how is that land calculated let's say in other systems which require an enormous amount of land beyond that to to mine the fertilizer etc like how how does that stack up if we yeah. if we look at the two and a half times should we be really worried can we still feed the world with these things i mean i think many people when they saw it, it was like oh okay this is going to be an argument that's going to be used against um let's say <laughs> region ag quite quite strongly what what is your um what is your response to when somebody said yes but it uses two and a half, two and a half times more land and we can't have that because we have to feed the world yeah, and I mean, this is a, there could be a whole podcast episode on this question itself. Um, but I think a, a few thoughts are that, you know, A, this type of system has the opportunity to use marginal land that would otherwise not be croppable. Um, and if you're not able to grow crops um, on a certain piece of land, that land wouldn't be able to support, um, you know, growing animal feed. Um, for example, for for confined animals um, in the U.S., I think the majority of our land is actually kind of pasture and rangeland, most of which is unsuitable for um, growing crops. Um, so there is there is an opportunity to add a little bit more nuance to the discussion about where is this appropriate from a land use perspective? Where is this maybe not appropriate from a land use perspective? Um, but I think that the other sort of thing to unpack is that, I mean, I focus mostly on the U.S. context, but we have um, we have quite a bit of cropland 
that is not actually growing food for people um, to eat, to consume directly. And so, you know, somehow we've gotten to a point where we have somewhere between, you know, 300 to 400 million acres um, of cropland in the U.S. And, you know, for scale, a country like Switzerland is 10 million acres. So we're we're talking about quite a bit of quite a bit of cropland in the U.S. And, you know, somehow 70 percent of that land is basically growing just two crops. Corn Se seven soy. zero, just for, um, for this is seven zero, not one seven. Yep, it's seven, massive. Seven yeah. zero, seventy percent of our U.S. cropland is pretty much growing just two crops, um, and a large majority of those two crops are going into livestock feed. Now, because of the efficiencies. Um, that have come with, you know, things like synthetic fertilizer, um, we have been able to increase yields of those crops to the point, um, and that along with the, you know, the animal genetics, where now we have animals that, um, you know, I think a, a Cornish cross chicken grows to market weight in six weeks or something like that. Um, so we have incredibly efficient animal genetics, incredibly efficient, um, you know, corn and soy farming that basically combined, um, you know, when you, when you confine all the animals to a small space, gives a very, very small land footprint. Um, however, that small land footprint is not without consequence. Um, so, for example, we have nitrate pollution um, pretty much everywhere in the U.S. in the groundwater. Um, part of that is from the fertilizer runoff for growing the feed so intensively. Part of that is from, you know, manure runoff from the, uh, the livestock, the confined livestock operations. Um, there are air pollution concerns as well with, uh, with confined animals, um, kind of going back to the aroma um, that apparently can be smelled for, for miles away. Um, so it's, you know, it's one of those things where I think land is worth a much more nuanced conversation about, you know, what, how should we be using our land? What should we be growing um, out of our cropland acres in the U.S.? I think less than 1% is growing, um, you know, fruits and vegetables and nuts and things like that. Um, a lot of it is really going towards um, growing the, the animal feed. Um, so, yeah, there's, I think there's more to unpack there than just it uses two and a half times uh, more land. Yeah, I think it's, there's, there's the question which you raised at the beginning, what kind, of, what kind of land? Second, if we take an old land into consideration, plus the externalities. Okay, that's a whole different discussion. And also, like, is that land of or the feed and ethanol, which is another huge issue like that, that yep. the, the land is there, let's say, uh, it's just not used to grow food in many cases, it's used to grow feed or fuel. And, and both of that should stop immediately. And this does seem to suggest that there is, um, especially the multi-species and holistic grazing or, or adaptive grazing, whatever we want to call it, um, for sure getting emails about this as well, but it's, it's a very intensive way of producing quite a lot of calories. Like, did you compare that as well? Like what this size farm almost per hectare or per acre produces compared to the neighbors in Georgia that are producing um, maybe the wheat corn rotation that you were mentioning before, like compared to the neighbors, like the amount of calories that people actually eat, um, white oak pastures is, is producing must be completely off the chart compared to the neighbors and not taking in a lot of inputs because they are very input low. Do they import a lot? Like does the system as a farm, therefore at a farm level need a lot of things coming into the farm or is it mostly quote unquote self-sufficient? Like what, what inputs do they, do they bring onto the farm? What if you, which you obviously counted as well into, into yeah. the LCAs. Yeah, so I, the answer to your first question is we didn't look at like a calorie per calorie basis. Um, I think that's also a very nuanced conversation. Then we need to look at the nutrients um, in, in the calories, the, yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, but in terms of the inputs for the farm, um, the, the beef, sheep, and goats were almost self-sufficient, like 100% grass-fed. Um, they were bringing in um, some minerals, um, so ruminants typically need. Um, they had a, a mobile mineral bar, 
and then um, you know the cows and the animals know exactly what their body needs and so that's a very very small input um, but otherwise for the um, hogs and the poultry um, those are monogastrics so they can't at least the species that we've bred right now, um, they can't survive on just the grass alone. Um, so they were bringing in um, feed for those animals, um, so grains. Um, but otherwise, I think those were the major inputs. You know, there's a little bit of fuel um, for them running their own um, for running their their trucks and and being able to get around the the 3,000 acres. Um, oh yeah, I have it right here. Poultry and pig feed, the mineral bar. Uh, oh, the the year kind of zero and one fields, they were seeding those fields um, with with uh, grass seed um, or the mix of their grass seed um, in the first few years, um, and then once it was seeded, they weren't doing any more of that. Um, and then it was fuel, electricity, and, and water. So pretty, um, yeah, the, the poultry and the pigs are hard because they do, they do require the external feed, um, but the ruminants were almost self-sufficient. So would that then suggest if the, the non-ruminants are, um, first of all, needing inputs and, and maybe because of that, and we'll get into the models later, but um, are, are not the biggest contributor, let's say, to the soil carbon side or to the, uh, they're a big contributor, contributor to the emission side. Would you then suggest, obviously not making farm suggestions, to, to get rid of that part of the system um, and keep the ruminants that clearly can survive on grass itself uh, after the seeding, obviously, and after a transition period? Or is that just a very simplistic reductionist uh, way of looking at uh, some of this data? Yeah, no, this is, that's an excellent question. Um, and I think that the important thing to remember is that the LCA is an oversimplified model of what is happening on the farm. And in our case, we were looking at a single component, which was the, the carbon and the greenhouse gas um, emissions coming from the farm. Um, whereas, you know, when you, when you visit the farm, when you hear Will Harris talk about um, the systems and the cycles that he's recreating, it becomes very apparent that having the multi-species is a really important part of the operation. Um, there are still things we're learning about how to best manage for livestock parasites, um, which can live in the soil for years and years and years. And actually having multiple species, um, and especially the, the chickens help to kind of scratch, the, the chickens follow the the cows, they kind of help to scratch and incorporate some of the manure. They eat the, the fly larvae um, that is growing in the manure, so they decrease the, the fly population, which can be quite a, a nuisance when you have livestock. Um, they're getting some additional feed and, and protein from eating that larvae. And there's some evidence that having the multi-species can help to reduce the parasite loads um, as well within the pastures. So we do know um, anecdotally and, and depending on what the, the field of study is, that there are um, innumerable benefits to having multiple species. Oh, that's the other thing is different species eat different grasses that are growing on the, the pasture. So the cows are going to have the things they like, the goats are going to have the things they like, the chickens are going to have the things they like. Um, so you kind of have a more balanced, um, healthier, more biodiverse pasture as well if you have the the multi-species. Um, the question on feed is, that kind of goes down an interesting rabbit hole because what you're optimizing for um, determines kind of the approach to the solutions. So for example, if we're optimizing for the, the most efficient CO2 equivalent animal protein, um, pork and um, chicken, typically end up being much more CO2 equivalent um, efficient compared to beef because of the methane emissions. Um, however, if you were trying to optimize for something like um, farming that's free of fossil fuels, all of a sudden the ruminants are probably going to have the, the biggest potential to achieve that. And that's where I think 
as we're sort of moving towards better understanding the role that agriculture plays in both climate change, but also in the potential to help producers adapt and potentially mitigate um, climate change, the conversation is going to evolve as to how we want to prioritize our, our different um, land use, animal protein, you know, what we grow for annual crops, um, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I think that's an, an excellent point that many people f forget. Um, and, and so what needs to happen, let's say, on the other side of the equation? You, you mostly look now at, let's say, the potential and the sequestration side of the LCAs that um, has been missing until now. And then luckily, other people are working on that as well. How do we bring the positive, the potential, positive potential to to an LCA and to this kind of research? But then looking at the other side, what we've been mentioning as well is that a lot of these models on, on methane, a lot of these models on emissions are models and, and don't reflect what has been happening uh, on these kind of pioneering farms. So do you see that um, work is needed to make these LCAs more robust also on the, let's say, the emission side? And, and if so, what needs to happen there? What would be interesting, um, interesting research projects to, to make the emission side more robust as well and not based on potentially outdated, maybe not, um, but potentially outdated models? Yeah, no, this is something I think about a lot um, in my line of work where there's a there's a saying, I think it's something like all models are wrong, most are useless. Um, and I think that applies very much to LCA as well, where the original goal of LCA was to pretty much help companies understand where the emissions hotspots were over an entire life cycle. Um, so the goal was to take a holistic approach to look at all elements of production from, um, if we take agriculture as an example, um, the upstream production of you know, fertilizers, um, all of the transportation of those fertilizers to the farm. Um, when you get to on-farm, you're looking at the application of those fertilizers, emissions associated with that, emissions associated with- Which are know, massive on passes. methane and nitrogen and, and all kinds of other emissions. Exactly. Bat, yeah. Exactly. And then, you know, after the farm gate, looking at um, what what's needed to convert, say, wheat into wheat flour, you know, how much fuel and energy and then how much energy does it take to transport all that flour to General Mills or, or whichever um, company is using it. So the original goal was to understand the hotspots that were occurring. Um, across an entire sort of life cycle approach. Um, the challenge is that we're now moving from a point in time in which companies wanted to understand the hotspots in the areas of opportunity to companies wanting, or I guess needing to quantify their emissions in a much more accurate way. And that's been a really um, kind of difficult thing because pretty much all of the databases that we rely on um, to do our, our LCA assessments, they're based on generic data. And a lot of times it's, it's looking at data at, say, the country level. Um, so, for example, it might have a data, a data set that's, you know, wheat grown in the U.S., but there's not a data set that's, you know, wheat grown using regenerative practices or, or wheat Georgia. grown yeah. using <laughs> irrigation or wheat grown in Georgia versus Kansas. Wow. So the the LCAs that we have been relying on, um, they give us essentially an estimate, um, but not a very accurate picture of what would actually be reflected um, on a specific farm or a specific operation. And I think this is where a lot of the tension is, is that because of that, we have a lot of groups that are focused right now on improving the accounting and improving the methodology development, basically to try and make the numbers more accurate to kind of reduce the, the uncertainty um, and the error bars that are associated with, um, with those LCAs. But I think what's interesting here is that we're sort of at a stage where because we've had so much LCA work done on different food and ag products in different countries, we, we're at a stage where we really know what drives farm level emissions. Um, and from a soil health perspective, you know, we're, we're learning new things every day, but 
We also have a general idea of what practices are going to lead to improved soil health. Um, but the challenge that I see in my industry is I think we're getting very caught up in trying to figure out how to quantify those emissions better, um, as opposed to focusing on how do we make the changes that we know that we need to see. So an example, you know, is that our, our nitrogen cycle right now is completely out of whack. Um, and ideally, we would focus on figuring out how do we get those nutrient management plans in place um, so that we don't have nitrates building up in our groundwater and in our surface water. Um, we also know from a climate change perspective that we need to figure out how to eliminate the fossil carbon from agriculture. That's both for the on-farm fuel in tractors and equipment, um, but also for the production of, say, synthetic nitrogen fertilizer. So there are things that we know we could focus on that would help agriculture align to what is needed um, to be aligned with the 1.5 degree future. And yet there's a lot of time and energy going into um, arguing about methodological improvements and especially things like the permanence of soil carbon, which is a, a pretty interesting, a hot topic. interesting yeah. topic. <laughs> so what would you tell, let, let's say we're in a, in a theater, I always like to use this, this example because I hope we, we imagine listening to this uh, wherever you are listening, it could be on a tractor, on, on a horse, on the land, it could be somewhere in a commute, etc. But imagine we're in a, in a nice old theater and we're on stage and we're doing this in person and, and the room is full, full of investors or people working in finance. Um, what would you tell them, obviously without giving investment advice, but to, to focus on in this, this field of work when they walk out of that uh, theater in the evening and say, okay, tomorrow morning, I'm going to, I'm going to dig deeper into X, Y, Z. What would you tell them? What are interesting places to, to start digging deeper and to understand more of, of this, this potential, but also, uh, the challenges and opportunities of let's say the LCA work or the, the measurement and trying to quantify these things. What would you, which direction would you give them? Oh, I have so many thoughts, um, but maybe maybe I'll start with what I think investors really should be or anyone working in the space should really be cautious um, about. And I think that's um, uh, being really cautious about carbon as a topic and in particular soil carbon sequestration. Um, I think in many ways what's happening with soil carbon sequestration and, you know, the associated work to develop carbon models and accounting is, is really taking a reductionist view of something that is actually part of a much more complex carbon cycle. Um, so, for example, there's the temporal element. Um, in order to be able to account for soil carbon sequestration, we have to pick an arbitrary point in time as a baseline state. Now, that baseline state is usually representing a, a very recent state rather than a historic state. So basically, when, when we restore soil health and sequester carbon, a lot of times it's happening on degraded lands, at least in the U.S. So essentially what we're doing is we're putting the carbon back that was lost from that land over the last several decades of soil degrading agricultural practices. Um, so setting a baseline of degraded land where you then have a huge potential to put back the soil carbon um, and then trying to sell that carbon as, say, offsets for companies to continue emitting, um, I would say is it's a little bit questionable and it's definitely not aligned with what's needed to achieve a 1.5C future. And I think the other really interesting element is that when we try and account for soil carbon sequestration, we're basically limiting soil carbon sequestration to a mere subtraction of carbon from the atmosphere. And we're kind of ignoring the whole, you know, complex carbon cycle that's associated with that. So in a healthy carbon cycle, the goal is not to lock up that carbon permanently and store it in the ground, which I think has largely been the focus of, say, soil carbon markets. But it's really to put that carbon to work as the lifeblood of our ecosystems. And so I think ruminants are a really good example where, you know, you have grass that's pulling carbon down from the atmosphere as it grows. Ruminants can consume this grass. Um, in turn, that tells the grass to keep growing, keep sending 
um, those sugars down to their roots. Um, and in the process, you know, the animal's depositing manure, which is helping to feed the soil microbes. It's helping to put carbon um, in the soil as well. And, you know, humans can't digest that grass. Uh, ruminants can because they have those special microbes in their rumen. And there is an associated release of methane from that. But methane is a short-lived um, climate pollutant. So basically it stays in the atmosphere for around 12 years before it then breaks down back into CO2 and H2O, which again are the building blocks for more grass. Um, and so the cycle then, the cycle then begins continues. again. And I think so, there's really a danger in separating all of those pieces out because then you get the, the kind of conventional thinking of methane is bad, soil carbon is good, which leads to people trying to figure out ways of minimizing methane and maximizing soil carbon sequestration, but oftentimes with solutions that continue to perpetuate um, distancing animals from the land. And so I think really smart you know, investors and, and people working in this space should realize that our goal should be to better understand, you know, what is a healthy carbon cycle? Where are our carbon cycles currently broken? And how can we restore the balance of carbon, you know, going into the atmosphere and carbon coming back out in a way where it's it's constantly flowing um, through the, the food system? So that's kind of the way that I like to think about this space is how do we really you know, move from soil carbon sequestration being just a single piece of the puzzle, one half of the equation, um, to how do we invest in restoring and rebalancing broken cycles, which are going to be much more long-term, deeply rooted solutions to, I think, many of our agricultural problems right now. So what would you do if you would be in charge of a, a large investment fund or a large investment portfolio, uh, let's say a billion dollars? Um, what would you focus on in terms of investments? How would you put, how and where would you put money to work if, if tomorrow morning you would be in charge of a, a considerable a sum of money with complete freedom of how to put that to work? Um, obviously as in or not obviously I, as investments, but the time horizon could be 20, 30, 50 or 200 years. Um, what, what would you focus on? Where would you, where would you start? What would you prioritize uh, if you had, uh, I wouldn't say unlimited, but almost unlimited resources. Yeah. I mean, for me personally, as someone who works at the intersection of kind of climate change and agriculture, what I would invest in is really fossil free farming. Um, investing in ideas and um, creative solutions that basically get the fossil fuels that are embedded in our conventional agricultural system um, completely phased out, ideally by 2050 um, at the latest, ideally sooner. Um, but ultimately, you know, to be al for agriculture to be aligned with a 1.5 C future, uh, we basically have to find ways to phase out all of the embedded fossil fuels. Um, I think I mentioned, you know, a lot of this is in the synthetic fertilizer production. A lot of this is in the on-farm um, tractor, fuel and energy. Um, there's quite a bit in, in transport as well. Um, and most people don't realize that the carbon footprint of row crops, at least in the U.S., is typically more than 50 percent um, from fossil fuels. Um, and so, wow. and that comes mostly, is, I mean, is that then, is there an 80, 20 there as well as like, is it the mostly fertilizer or mostly tractors? Um, it's should we focus much 50, on 50, 50, wow. Okay. 50, 50 so electric tractors is, make sense and, and focusing on all the bio fertilizer stimulants and, and everything and how to produce massive amounts of high quality compost, etc., should get equal, equal attention in your, in your fund. Exactly, exactly. And I think what's happening right now is, you know, soil carbon, soil carbon sequestration, it's having its day in the sun right now. Um, but when we think about specifically the climate ROI, um, finding ways to invest in phasing out the fossil carbon of agriculture is going to have a much higher climate return on investment than storing carbon in the soil. 
Um, there are definitely benefits to increasing soil carbon stocks. Um, we absolutely should be doing that. But really, when we're thinking about this, you know, Paris Agreement, this global goal of, of trying to limit warming to 1.5 C, then we need fossil fuels to be phased out and soil carbon to be sequestered, but they're not interchangeable. So we can't just use soil carbon to offset um, our agricultural fossil carbon um, emissions. And I think that's where, that's where I see a big opportunity because right now, the way that LCAs are presented, they combine all of the different agricultural greenhouse gases into that single metric of CO2 equivalents. Um, but if we start dividing out um, the now sources... Now we get to a whole different podcast, but yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely listening because no. this is fascinating. No, no, it's, it's, I think it's one of those huge issues. We put everything under equivalent and they're not equivalent. Like methane is 12 years and, and is a building block for other stuff. Eggs. So. Exactly, so when we when exactly. we start splitting that, like what would it look like, um, and what would you focus on then? Yeah, so when we start splitting it, that's when we realize just how significant the fossil carbon um, portion of the emissions are to agriculture. Um, but also, you know, one of the really key elements is that um, you know methane and nitrous oxide they are biogenic emissions. They're emissions that are an, an inherent part of our ecosystems. You know, even if we didn't have any humans living on earth, we would still have methane emissions. We would still have N2O emissions. Um, whereas, so there's the biogenic carbon cycle, there's the fossil carbon cycle, and they need to be treated differently. The, and that's because, you know, as we think about what's needed to achieve a 1.5 degree future, um, we still need deep reductions in methane and N2O, but the goal is not to fully eliminate methane and N2O. The goal stop, is to make sure that... Stop burning dinosaur bones. Yeah, that's the... Exactly, exactly. So that's why it's really important that they're treated differently and, you know, why there's sort of a danger to the oversimplification of LCAs in the agricultural space um, using... CO2 equivalent. And the analogy that I like to use is, you know, if you went to your doctor and you said, um, I need help making sure that I have a healthy, balanced diet. Um, if your doctor basically told you just count the number of calories that you're eating, you would probably be a little bit skeptical because you'd, you'd probably dive deeper and say, well, well, how much protein should I be eating? How much fat should I be eating? How much, you know, carbohydrate should I be eating? And if all they say is calories, then you would probably try and find another doctor. Um, and I think it's similar for LCA and agriculture and climate change, where the predominant way we've been thinking about things is sort of CO2 equivalent as basically the calorie metric, where it combines everything into one, you know, metric that looks clean, I guess, on a nutrition label. Um, but if you dig a little bit deeper, you realize that we have different targets for methane, we have different targets for nitrous oxide, and we have different targets for fossil carbon. And if we want a healthy, balanced carbon cycle, a healthy, balanced nitrogen cycle, and ultimately, you know, a climate that's not um, unsafe for a lot of our, our populations, we need to start digging deeper and tracking progress towards those individual targets and start to move away um, from the, the oversimplified um, CO2 equivalent metric. And would that be, this is a perfect bridge to the magic wand question I like to ask, if you can change one thing in, in agriculture and food or in LCAs in general or in the sustainability space or regenerate, regenerative space, um, so you're no longer in, in charge of your fund, but if you would be able to change one thing overnight, what would that be? Yeah, I, I thought a lot about this question because there are quite a few areas that would be interesting to see change in. But I think what I came up with is that if I could change just one thing, it would be a collective societal agreement that we will no longer tolerate agricultural pollution. Um, so at least, you know, in the U.S. context, all across the U.S., we have groundwater that's polluted with nitrates. Um, that's not only a health hazard for people, um, but it's also quite costly. Um, the water treatment plants to remove these nitrates could run a small rural town of 700 people, something like $2.4 million to install. Um, 
Wow. And we have dead Let's zones. Let's say it's cheaper to pay yeah. farmers to change practices, I think. <laughs> it would be much cheaper to, to do some preventative. Um, and like yeah, usually, also artist. in healthcare, that's the same, yeah. It's funny how that works. It's funny how that works. Um, yeah, I read an article recently that said, you know, even if every farmer in the U.S. stopped fertilizing tomorrow, it could take decades for the nitrates that are already in our U.S. groundwater to actually dissipate. Um, so that's groundwater. We have dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico, um, in the Chesapeake Bay. It's really wreaking havoc on our ecosystems. And it's very disappointing when, you know, water is unsafe to swim or to fish from um, due to, to agricultural pollution. Um, so I think we're kind of at a stage where, you know, in many cases, the pollution that is directly tied to agriculture is it's incompatible with, you know, having um, having life and thriving ecosystems and, and thriving communities. And I think if we were at a point where if we could collectively agree as a society that we were not no longer willing to tolerate those nitrates in our groundwater, to tolerate having dead zones, unsafe drinking water, unsafe fishing and recreational water, I think that would go a long way towards changing the agricultural landscape, how we manage our land, what we grow, um, et cetera, et cetera. And as a final question, I mean, you've mentioned a few things, but maybe there's something that really stands out. Um, what do you believe to be true about regenerative agriculture that others don't? And this is definitely inspired by a question that John Kempf always asks, or usually asks. I haven't yeah. listened recently to see if he still asks this, but and what do you believe to be true? Where are you contrarian? Yeah, I mean, I. it's always hard to know who, what, what, who's thinking what um, in this, this space because it's so big. But in my opinion, I think we're really only scratching the surface of what regenerative agriculture could be. Now, this is sp speaking from someone who's coming at this from the corporate regenerative agriculture side of things. And I think a big part of this is to do with potentially confusing what is a basic best practice for managing soil health and agricultural pollution, such as erosion and runoff, with regenerative practices. So, you know, I've seen um, kind of proposals for regenerative agriculture pilot projects, corporate funded pilot projects that focus solely on, say, a single practice like cover cropping. Um, and that's called regenerative agriculture. Now, I'm pretty sure the NRCS in the US has been trying to promote cover cropping for the last 50 years as just a, a basic best practice for, for soil health. Um, another example is that livestock integration gets talked about a lot as a basic principle of regenerative agriculture, and yet, you know, most uh, most of the corporate pilots related to regenerative agriculture are focused on growing feed regeneratively while still keeping those animals distanced from the land. Um, which I think sort of begs cutting really... you off from all the potential <laughs> that we just discussed for the last hour plus, yeah. Exactly. And I think that begs quite an interesting question that I think is being danced around right now in the region ag space, which is around, you know, what is the role of synthetic nitrogen fertilizer in regenerative agriculture? Because region ag, most people are talking about it in terms of, you know, farming in harmony with nature. Um, we do have several kind of early adopter pioneer examples um, I think Gabe Brown said he hasn't been using synthetic nitrogen fertilizer for almost two decades now. Um, and that's through, you know, animal integration and very careful rebalancing of the carbon and nitrogen cycles and, and the soil biology um, within his operations. But I have yet to see a corporate funded regenerative agriculture pilot with a stated goal of either deeply reducing or eliminating um, synthetic nitrogen fertilizer. And then I think one last thought I had on this question is that, you know, our food system as a whole really has quite a few large cracks. Um, so, for example, you know, when you go to at least in the U.S., if you go to the supermarket in the middle of winter and pick up, you know, one pound of, of tomatoes, um, you can think about the fact that the farm worker was likely paid on the order of a single penny to pick that pound of potato of tomatoes. And I think regenerative agriculture could give us an opportunity to start to address some of these cracks. But in order to do that, we have to really acknowledge that they're there. 
And I think the current regen ag landscape is it's sort of dancing around the the cracks or the fissures um, in our food system and just trying to come up with solutions that take our existing system and turn it regenerative. Um, but I think what's cool is in Japan, they have a term called um, kintsugi, which is basically where they repair cracked pottery with gold. Um, and then I think that piece becomes even more valuable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, the cracked piece becomes even more valuable. Um, and I see an opportunity to do that here with regenerative agriculture where, you know, we can start a somewhat uncomfortable dialogue that acknowledges where some of these, you know, and brings to light where some of these cracks are so that we can find collaborative ways of, you know, sealing them back up um, in a way that really brings kind of long-term, um, deep-rooted solutions as opposed to potentially more, um, you know, shallow-rooted, not holistic um, solutions to a lot of the problems that we face in our agriculture and, and food systems. I think it's a perfect and, and a perfect metaphor. I mean, there are very uncomfortable cracks in, in this agriculture system, and we need to have a deep look at how we got to such an extractive system in many places, not not just a few decades, but a few millennia. And I just finished a book, she should be on the podcast soon, hopefully, um, Healing Grounds of Liz Carlisle, her latest book, and um, which I'll put in links below as well in the show notes. And we really have to face the social side, but also the land ownership side, the non-diversity side globally, the indigenous side, the access to food side. I mean, there are many uncomfortable, but I think absolutely essential um, essential cracks to, to talk about because otherwise, as uh, I think it was Lauren Tucker saying um, of uh, Renourish Studio, if we keep talking about soil health and focus everything on soil health, that's what we're going to get, healthier soil and not fix any of the other things that we uh, very uncomfortably got ourselves into. And I'm not blaming anybody. We all did this. We all were part of this. But it is uh, definitely a system that needs a bit more than a few cover crops here and there and a few extra animals on the land and a bit of compost and then, then we'll be, all be fine. Uh, this is a this is a much deeper and it does a much longer uh, transition that we you know, we need to be ready to get uncomfortable. I agree. I agree. And so I want to thank you for that. This is we can go in ten other directions for another hour, <laughs> but I want to be conscious of your time and of the listeners. But this means we we need to have you back at some point. And thank you so much for the work you do for explaining uh, the magical, interesting, challenging world of LCAs. And uh, thank you for, for coming on and sharing about it. Anytime. Happy to be here. Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. For the show notes and links discussed, check out our website, investinginregenerativeagriculture.com forward slash post. Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. For the show notes and links we discussed in this episode, check out our website investing in regenerativeagriculture.com forward slash posts. If you like this episode, why not share it with a friend or give us a rating on Apple Podcasts? That really helps. Thanks again and see you next time.